loud enough? Maybe I'll lower it down a notch. How's that? Okay. So my name is Justin Casper. I'm at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, I study the solar wind, and today I'm going to talk to you about the solar wind. So the solar wind is the uh, outcome of the hot solar corona. Uh, you've seen all these uh, amazing pictures and movies yesterday by in Carl Schreiber's presentation of the amount of structure that we see in the solar corona, how complex the magnetic field is. What doesn't end there, uh, as an outcome of that complex magnetic field topology and that those high temperatures, we get a supersonic solar wind that's constantly streaming away from the sun. And there's a lot going on, and it can get up to uh, 10 or 20 times the speed of sound. Uh, it's obviously not a simple, spherically symmetric distribution. Uh, it has a lot of structure. Every now and then you can see a chromal mass ejection flying out. All right? So there's a lot of rich physics going on within the solar wind. All right, so the goals of this presentation. Is there a little feedback uh, issue? How about that? OK, much better. All right, so my goals, I want to give you a sense of the historical progression of our observational and theoretical understanding of the solar wind. Um, and there are three things I, I want to get across uh, about why we study the solar wind. First, to establish the connection between the sun and interplanetary space. Uh, second, to understand uh, the heating and the escape from the solar corona. And third, the solar wind is an opportunity to just investigate some very fundamental plasma physics processes, heating, dissipation, formation of shocks, uh, interactions between different species of particles in the plasma. I'll give you a three-dimensional picture of the solar wind, and I'll try to highlight some open questions uh, and future opportunities in the field of solar wind. So first, I want to talk about how we explore the solar wind. Uh, on the left, uh, this is a photograph of Explorer 1, uh, the first uh, American payload sent into space. That's actually a full-scale model of the entire spacecraft. Uh, here we have a photograph of the twin st uh, stereo spacecraft uh, back in 2006, a few months before launch. Uh, so you can see over the last uh, half century, we've greatly progressed in the sophistication of our spacecraft and the instruments that they carry. So what I want to do is talk about some of the observational techniques that are employed to study the solar wind. I'll begin with eclipses. Uh, that's that um, SOHO image, that I, the SOHO movie that I showed at the beginning of this talk is an example of an artificial eclipse. You block the sun directly, and you use Thomson scattering. So white light scattering off of electrons in the coronal atmosphere gives you an image of the high density structures in the corona. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about comets, where the observational technique involved ionization, radiation pressure, some of the early spacecraft and the measurements they made, our current observational capability, and then future plans, including the Solar Probe Plus and Solar Orbiter missions. So earliest hints of the solar wind. Uh, astronomers have used solar eclipses to study the moon and the sun for thousands of years. Some of the earliest recorded observations of eclipses uh, date back more than uh, 8,000 years. Here's a 1571 painting of astronomers studying an eclipse. It's actually astrologers studying the eclipse. Back then, we were all astrologers. Uh, when direct sunlight is blocked, a uh, corona, and that was Latin, that's Latin for crown, uh, but this crown of material appears surrounding the sun. Now, Modern eclipses give us uh, much more resolution. We can see all this incredible fine detail. And if you think about the magnetic field models of the corona that you've seen over the last couple days, right here, you can see that this high density structure, the, these bands of white light, are roughly tracing the magnetic field structure in the corona. And if you look carefully, you can see here are loop structures that are still closed. Here are open regions that are extending just straight out in interplanetary space. And this is where the fast solar wind is escaping from coronal holes. And here is where slow solar wind in a big streamer belt is gradually escaping. Now, people didn't know this when they saw the, uh, the corona. right? But if now we, and I'll show you, the mere fact that you see structure this far out from the sun uh, is a smoking gun for the fact that the corona is extremely hot. And eventually, people realize that the fact that the corona is so hot requires that there be a supersonic uh, wind escaping from it. So is the early evidence for the solar wind. Well, I, I think you've heard a couple times now about this famous uh, 1859 Carrington event. Uh, that was uh, Carrington and another scientist, Richard Hodgson, each observed a solar flare that was so strong they could see it in visible light 
Now, there was a severe geomagnetic disturbance observed the following day. Uh, now, if it, it took one day to get here, anyone have a sense of about how fast it was moving? <laughs> one AU per day, that's right. Anyone want to guess in uh, kilometers per second? Let's get the brain going, yeah. 4,000 kilometers per second, a little bit less than that. But on the order of thousands of uh, kilometers per second, that's, that's good for thinking on the fly. You know, an AU is about 1.5 to the 8 kilometers. Day is 86,400 seconds. Uh, so it was moving at around 1,500 kilometers per second. And so Carrington proposed, amongst others, that at least occasionally the sun must give off blobs of magnetic stuff that, that moves away at the order of a couple, you know, one to 2,000 kilometers per second. Now, we, we know now that that was a rather special event. That was a very large, very magnetized chromal mass ejection. If we move on to 1908, as a good example, Comet Morehouse, and here's a photograph of the comet. And you can see uh, that it has a very structured tail. Uh, the tail was constantly flapping around. It would break up and then reform. And at certain times, there were eight, uh, six, or seven separate chunks of the tail moving off in different directions. Uh, Eddington suggested that those variable tails, this is in 1910, required some kind of particle radiation to be blowing past the comet to take this charged material and, and pull it along. Um, Birkeland, in 1916, just a few years later, proposed that the fact that these comet tails were so variable and the fact that you almost continuously saw an aurora at high latitudes implied that there was a continuous flow of both ions and electrons from the sun. So by the beginning of the 20th century, there's the sense that you know, it's not just uh, violent solar eruptions that eject something into space, but maybe there's a constant stream of material flowing away. And it turns out they were right, and that was the solar wind. So now what I'd like to do is walk through the, the physics of solar wind acceleration. So let's skip ahead to the 50s and go through a couple facts that were pretty agreed upon by this time. First, as I said, there was this acceptance of the idea that for one reason or another, there was a pretty significant flux of ions and electrons in interplanetary space, likely flowing continuously. The coronal temperatures, the fact that the corona was heated up to temperatures of millions of degrees, people had accepted this by now. Um, and Sidney Chapman realized that at those high temperatures, the corona is actually going to be an excellent conductor of heat. Actually, the solar corona is almost as good an electrical conductor as copper. Uh, so if you can have heat flow that efficiently through the corona, Chapman realized that you know, this heat could conduct very far out away from the surface of the sun. And it was possible that there could be some extended hot atmosphere reaching out in interplanetary space. Around this same time, uh, Ludwig Biermann predicted, based on a quantitative analysis of the dynamics of comet tails, uh, some numbers to explain uh, what the plasma must be like uh, in interplanetary space. And he suggested continuous flow speeds between 500 and 1,500 kilometers per second, densities of around 500 protons per cubic centimeter at 1 AU. And we now know that's a bit of an overestimate by about a factor of 100. But the key thing here is this really high speed. So what I want to do now is consider uh, three models. So in the, fifth, in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, you had kind of three different uh, possible paradigms emerging for explaining this radiation, this particle radiation in interplanetary space. I'm simplifying, you know, there were a lot of people involved in predicting this, but I thought it would be good uh, for this lecture to kind of try to distill it down to three models of increasing sophistication to give you a sense of the, um, the physics involved in predicting the solar wind, understanding how this acceleration happens. So we're going to look at, one, the thought that you just have a very extended atmosphere. Nothing's moving around. It's just lofted up to extremely high altitudes. It's like Earth's atmosphere, but you know, in stretching out more than an AU. Model two is that there's a breeze. So the, what's happening is the corona is extremely hot. So you, know, you have a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of the speeds of the particles in the corona. 
maybe some fraction of them that have enough speed to escape uh, local gravity are able to make it all the way out to 1 AU. Uh, and then you have this idea that actually almost the whole corona can get converted in bulk into a supersonic solar wind flow. So let's start with the extended static atmosphere. Uh, here's a reference to the a nice article summarizing this. So let's start by considering a patch in a very simple spherically symmetric uh, sun uh, corona with some area A a thickness dr, and it's some distance r away from the sun. And one of the points as we go through all these different solar wind models, what, what you'll see is all I'm doing is I'm constantly taking the conservation of mass flux, the momentum equation, I'm assuming things are ideal gases. Um, that's all I'm doing. And then I'm just taking lots of derivatives, moving things around. What I've tried to do is capture all the derivations in here. I think it's fine if you don't follow every single step that I did during this, but I think it's good to have it all here in writing so you can see how these derivations are done. But, so let's start with this simple hydrostatic atmosphere. So if I have this parcel of plasma sitting in the corona, there are going to be two forces acting on it. There's going to be a force due to the gradient in pressure, so the area uh, of the parcel times the derivative in pressure. And remember, we're assuming it's all spherically symmetric, so that's all in the radial direction. Now there'll be a counteracting force, which is gravity pulling that piece of plasma back down to the surface of the sun. All right? Rho G A D R, where rho of R is just the density of the plasma at that height, and G of R is the local gravity. Now in static equilibrium, those forces are going to balance. So the change in pressure is just given by negative uh, rho G D R. Now what I'm going to do is use the fact that this is an ideal gas, we're assuming. Uh, I'm going to use a relationship for the mass density, which is just some uh, mass m per particle times the number density. Right, plugging that in here, I get this relationship dn over n goes as minus dr over h, where h, and h can be a function of height above the sun, is a scale height. Uh, kt, where t is the temperature of the plasma, over mg. And I should point out m is the mean molecular mass. So if it's half protons and it's half electrons, uh, then the mean, uh, molecular, mean mass per particle is going to be about half of the proton mass. OK. So how, how do we apply this? Well, here's an example, just an aside. Let's assume very close to the sun, g and t are constant. Right? Then the solution to that uh, derivative is very simple. Uh, the natural log of the density falls off as minus r over h. So the density falls off exponentially with height above the surface of the sun. If I plug in numbers for uh, the photospheric temperature of 6,000 degrees Kelvin, uh, the gravitational force at the surface of the sun, just we know the mass of the sun, and people knew that 100 years ago, I can calculate what this uh, scale height should be. And I get somewhere around uh, 200 kilometers. And we have a problem here, because if you look at this coronal image during an eclipse, and people have had plenty of opportunities by uh, you know, the 1850s, uh, by the turn of the um, by like 1900, to look at eclipses and think about this. The scale height where the, for the density falling off is much greater than 200 kilometers. I mean, this stuff clearly extends out like at least an entire solar radius. So what can you do to make this scale height a thousand times larger? There are two things that you could do. Does anyone have a proposal? Just look at the, uh, I've got Boltzmann constant. I can't change that. Let's say we know the mass of the sun, so we know what gravity is. So what are the, what are the two things that could be happening to make this 1,000 times larger? Temperature, and what would you do to the temperature? Make it like 1,000 times hotter, right? But that's stupid. I mean, come on, the photosphere is at 6,000 degrees. How could the corona possibly be hotter than the photosphere? So what's the other thing that you could do? Anyone know? Yes, make the mass smaller. There must be a new form of matter that you can't detect at Earth called coronium that weighs a thousandth, a thousandth the mass of the proton. And that, for years, is what people thought was going on. I make allusions to dark matter today, right? 
Um, okay, so it, it just seemed preposterous back then to think that the corona could be hotter than the surface beneath it. So people sided with the idea of coronium in this new form of matter. It sounds crazy. On the other hand, there was a precedent for the discovery of new forms of matter by studying the sun. Helium was actually first detected looking at solar spectra, right? Helium from the Greek word helios, for the god of the sun. So people just thought, oh, okay, we've done it again. There's another thing out there. All right, well, it turns out uh, as, as uh, our understanding of hot materials improved, uh, we eventually realized that these bizarre atomic line uh, emissions that we were seeing from the corona implied this temperature of millions of degrees. Coronium was out and a hot corona was in. Okay, so that's in a side close to the sun. What did Chapman do with this static atmosphere model? Well, in reality, gravity is gonna be falling off as one over R squared, uh, and temperature is gonna fall off as the solar wind expanded. Um, so if temperature is falling off, again, the scale height is going to start getting small, and you wouldn't expect to see material making it very far from the sun. But as I said at the beginning of this, Chapman realized that actually the corona was a really good conductor of heat. So maybe that scale height H uh, is actually going to uh, be pretty large, and that's going to permit a lot of uh, a substantial density out in interplanetary space. So here are Chapman's predictions. Made some simple assumptions. T has some maximum, T naught at some height, R naught, a little bit above the surface of the sun. Used a model for the thermal conductivity, which I will not get into. Uh, and had a prediction there for, of temperature as a function of distance from the sun. T goes as R to the minus 2 sevenths, kind of weakly falling off with distance. You were able to get plasma out at uh, 1 AU. One amusing thing about this period is um, Bierman's predictions about the uh, density at 1 AU, as I said, were off by a factor of 100, about 100 times too high. All these theorists were able to produce that factor of 100 times too high density. Um, and then we had to revise, correct the models once we had uh, real measurements in space. Uh, but anyway, easy peasy, able to get the density. Uh, although it was a little odd, the density is at a minimum in about 0.8 AU, AU and then actually rises up and reaches an asymptotic value at infinity using this model. And there were no net flows, it's static. So you have density, but you don't have motion of matter. All right, well, that's, that's a bit of a problem because as I said, the comet tail data suggests the plasma's flowing at like 1,000 kilometers per second. So enter model number two. This is by uh, Joseph Chamberlain. Uh, here's the reference in AppJ, this was in 1960. All right, Chamberlain assumes there's some surface. All right, below this surface, the density is high enough that you know, alphas and protons and electrons are constantly bumping into each other. You know, they're in nice uh, thermal equilibrium, they're collisional, everything has a nice Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. But for some reason, you know, they've gotten up to this temperature of millions of degrees. Now, what Chamberlain assumed was that above that surface, the ions and electrons become collisionless. So the density is low enough that you have a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution of speeds but the particles are no longer hitting each other. They just fly in trajectories, free to do whatever they want, just only under the bounds of gravitational pull from the sun. So I, have you seen the Boltzmann distribution function already? Okay, so I'm just repeating it here. Uh, I like to talk about thermal speeds. So here's the relationship I use between a most probable thermal speed and the temperature of a given species. Uh, so we use the Boltzmann distribution we just set the bulk velocity to zero. And what's the idea is all particles with speed V greater than the escape speed, 2G M of the sun over distance R square rooted will leave the corona and will never come back. All right, so here's a plot uh, of what things might look like at three solar radii. Uh, the escape speed is about 300 kilometers per second. Uh, here I'm showing the proton distribution with a temperature of around one megakelvin, right? So blue indicates all of the protons. Red indicates the narrow segment of this population of protons with enough speed to escape from the sun. Okay, so Chamberlain had some predictions. Um, if you, this does not look like a Maxwellian, but you could still calculate like an RMS thermal speed across it. So he had an effective temperature. He's predicted temperature when is one over uh, the square root of the distance from the sun. Um, so predicting temperatures about a quarter of Chapman's 
at 1 AU. And again, the densities were almost dead on. Uh, now, if you think about this, here's the population of protons that can just barely escape the sun's gravity at a few solar radii. What are they going to look like when they're all the way out at Earth orbit? Well, they lose a lot of that energy because they're escaping from the sun's gravitational well. So by the time you're at 1 AU, they're actually shifted down close to, uh, with the, the peak of the distribution, close to zero net flow, because they were just able to escape from the sun. So if you average over this distribution at 1 AU, you get a small speed, uh, you know, speeds of around 20 kilometers per second, say, at 1 AU. So we call this the solar breeze model. You're able to get particles out, but it's more of a gentle breeze than you know, Mach 20. OK, so now enter Parker. You'll notice, by the way, if you look closely, I'm not presenting these in chronological order. I'm presenting them in inter entertaining order. So Parker writes this paper, Dynamics of the Interplanetary Gas and Magnetic Fields, in 1958. It is a tour de force. He comes up with a mechanism for producing supersonic solar wind flow. He shows what temperatures the corona should have to produce the speeds that we observe. He comes up with the Parker spiral, which I'll talk about, which is this equation for the shape that magnetic fields and streams are going to take in interplanetary space. He takes that and he calculates how the solar corona and this shape can actually affect the angular momentum loss of stars in general. And he realizes that this expanding plasma will generate instabilities through something called the mirror instability, which I won't get into. Uh, and that can generate fluctuations that can block galactic cosmic rays and might have other astrophysical applications. In like one eight-page paper, it took him two years to get this accepted. It was rejected twice by reviewers. And finally, Chandra Shikhar, who is the editor of the journal, decided to override uh, the reviewers and have the paper published, saying, you know, even if it's totally wrong, it is, uh, you know, worth stimulating the community. You know, for like a decade, everyone railed on Parker. The stuff is ridiculous, and now today, everyone accepts it. All right. So Parker begins with several. I, I highly recommend reading it. It's a it's a very readable article. Um, he begins with several concerns about previous models. First, the predictions of speeds are way off. In the static atmosphere, there's zero net flow. Uh, in the breeze model, uh, you only get like 10 or 20 kilometers per second. It's got to be at least 10 times larger than that. Uh, you need a way to produce high speeds and sustain them as the plasma expands away from the sun. Now, Chapman's model requires, and this is shown in Parker's paper, a finite pressure at infinity that is many orders of magnitude smaller than the pressure of the interstellar medium. So Parker also claimed, like, just the... The, what, the fact that our sun is embedded in interstellar space kind of prohibits this um, hydrostatic distribution from developing and being stable. So in fact, what has to happen is that static molecular beam is unstable. And therefore, there will be continuous outward hydrodynamic expansion of the corona. OK, so where does this expansion emerge from? And can it produce supersonic flows? So what I want to. What I want to walk you through is just in general, how, what, what could you do to a fluid and, and, and get it up to a supersonic speed? All right, so let's consider an isothermal, so fixed temperature, ideal gas, uh, density rho flowing through some, some tube with cross-sectional area A and speed U. Right? Now, I'll just be drawing actual tubes, but I, I wanted to give you a sense that, you know, you could imagine this going on in the solar corona, right? The, the tube would be some structure. Maybe it falls, expands as one over, like it, maybe it expands in uniform solid angle. Uh, maybe it has some weird expansion profile because the magnetic field is expanding faster or more slowly than one over r squared. But you can imagine there, there are tubes in the corona that the plasma is flowing along. Again, we're going to go back to the exact same equation. So we want to conserve mass flux. So the flux at any point along this tube is the density, the cross-sectional area, and the speed it's flowing at. Now, if I'm not inventing matter, df dt, total derivative is 0. So I can differentiate this and then divide by it. And I get d rho over rho plus d over a plus d over u equals 0. Now, an aside that we're going to make use of in a couple steps. 
Have you talked about sound speed in an ideal gas? Okay, so let me just remind you, the square of the sound speed of an ideal gas can be given by um, gamma, which is the ratio of specific heats in the gas under constant volume and pressure. It's a factor that's around unity. Uh, times the ratio of the pressure to the density. Now, if we assume gamma is one, um, and we use the ideal gas, you know, P equals NKT, I can convert this into just KT over M, that, that mean molecular mass, right? And so what you see is the speed of sound is just a function of the temperature and mass of the particles in the gas. And if we're assuming it's isothermal, we have one constant speed of sound throughout this whole tube. We'll make use of that. Now, since this is a constant, I can also differentiate and say that a change in the pressure is just given by the sound speed squared times a change in the density. And we'll make use of this. All right, now let's go back to the momentum equation that we've used before. In one dimension, and again, here's where if your eyes blur a little bit, that's, that's fine. I just want this all here so you can go through it again and, and have this all uh, in writing. But I'm taking the one dimensional momentum equation where uh, the mass, the uh, speed, and the derivative of the speed is balanced by uh, any gradients in pressure. All right? And now what I want to do is I want to get rid of pressure. I want to have as few independent variables as possible. Well, I have this relationship for a change in pressure. So I'm just going to pull it in here and substitute for pressure. And this gives me an equation uh, relating changes in density to changes in speed. Putting this all together, back into this equation here, I get the expression I'm, I'm aiming for here. And this is the one I want you to think about, and we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit. The change in the area, all right, dA over A, the fractional change in the area, is proportional to the fractional change in the speed of the plasma, but with this prefactor, the ratio of the speed of the flow to the sound speed, minus 1. So if the speed is less than the speed of sound, if, if the Mach number is less than 1, all right, then this prefactor is negative. Right? If it's greater than 1, then this prefactor is positive. So let's consider the implications. All right? Acceleration in a tube that's always converging. Here's my tube. We're moving this way. Right? Here's our governing simple equation. Right? So what's the sign of dA over A going to be moving in this direction always? Not the value, just the sign. Would it be positive or negative? Negative. Good. All right. So when u is less than cs, what will the sign of du over u always be? Did I hear you say something? Positive. That's right. right? So as the plasma flows, it's going to start going faster and faster. And the area is going to keep dropping. So the speed is just going to keep increasing. Great. Until it reaches the speed of sound. Then what happens? Right? What changes in this equation when the Mach number is greater than 1? The sign flips, right? So now what's going to happen to the speed? It's going to start decreasing, right? We call this stagnation. So the flow will actually stall in this converging tube when it reaches the speed of sound. And here's a little, here's the solution to this equation. So you, you know, it gets up to the speed of sound, and then everything goes to hell. All right, so w we need to come up with a way to stop that flow from stalling when it reaches Mach 1. And we take our inspiration from steam turbines. So this was an idea uh, proposed by an inventor named De Laval. Uh, and it was an attempt to make steam turbines more efficient. And De Laval's thought was, you know, blowing steam across a turbine is a great way to produce power. But what if I could have the steam accelerated to multiple times the speed of sound? Like, then I'd have a really great turbine. And the trick that De Laval realized, if you look at each of these nozzles that are producing the jet of steam, is first the tube constricts, so the steam speeds up. But right around where the steam is reaching the speed of sound, you flip the direction of the growth of the tube. Instead of shrinking it, you now have it expand. 
So let's think about that. We're going to have a tube that constricts until the flow gets up to the speed of sound. And then as it reaches the speed of sound, we now have it open up. All right? So what happens to du over u when u is greater than cs? All right? dA over A is now positive. right? U over cs squared minus 1 is positive. So the plasma or the gas continues to accelerate. All right? If the flow doesn't become supersonic by this inflection point, um, then it'll slow down. But otherwise, it'll become supersonic. And this is always the case if it's opening up into a perfect vacuum. So just making a little plot of this. All right, we made it to the sonic point, and we kept accelerating. Now, it turns out um, the de Laval nozzle was not a great idea for a steam turbine. When you take a early 20th century, late 19th century uh, turbine technology and blast it with a supersonic jet of steam, it tends to just fall apart. Uh, but the de Laval nozzle actually plays a, a huge role in, in our field, in our science. It enables all of our science in space. And that's because de Laval nozzles play a critical role in boosting the power of rocket engines. So this is a, a photograph of an early prototype of a rocket nozzle uh, developed by Robert Goddard, Goddard the uh, pioneer of rocketry in the United States. And you can see here Goddard is attempting to reproduce this de Laval nozzle. So he has combustion happening in a chamber. You have this rapidly expanding uh, gas uh, being produced. You constrict it. So it starts speeding up. And then when it reaches the speed of sound, you have the uh, tube diverge, and you can produce a supersonic um, exit. And actually, this makes rocket engines much, much more efficient. It allows you to get much more material into space with less fuel. And uh, a really nice example of a, uh, of a de Laval nozzle is the, uh, the Apollo Command and Service Module. And here again, you can see all, the, all these bell jars, all these rocket nozzles follow this de Laval profile. So you get a nice supersonic flow uh, coming out the back when you turn on your rocket. All right, well, Parker realized that the plasma in the solar corona might act like a de Laval nozzle. Instead of a converging tube, you have density and pressure gradients. Uh, instead of the tube then diverging at just the right time, you have the fact that the plasma is expanding out uh, spherically. In fact, it, it turns out this, this really only works in 3D. You have to have that spherical expansion um, you know, guided by the magnetic field or just the fact that the plasma is freely expanding away from the sun. So we're going to consider today a very simple version of this where the corona is assumed to be isothermal at some temperature, T0, uh, and that T is negligible uh, far away from the sun. We'll call this the isothermal Parker model. And it's from that 58 paper. So again, it's essential that we use the 3D MHD equations. We're going to do the exact same conservation of particle number, um, same uh, equation of motion. All right, only now I have, in addition to a derivative in speed and a pressure gradient, I have to add in gravity. OK, I'm not going to go through every step in this, because there's a lot of, you know, well, it's spherical, so I have a lot of R squares you know, I need to handle and take derivatives of. But it's basically the same process as before. I, I look at my sound speed. I say it's constant. I take derivatives. And, and what I'm doing is I'm just constantly working at this removing variables. I'm, I'm taking out the pressure. I'm, I'm taking out the density. All right? Math, math, math. All right? And now I have a differential equation, ultimately that relates the speed and the sp radial derivative of the speed to distance. Right? My only variables are speed and distance. Sound, speed of sound is fixed. Right? And if you walk through the derivation, you'll see there's this critical speed uh, just given by g solar mass, mass of the particles over 2 kT. Right? And much like the de Laval nozzle, where, where something very critical is happening right at the, at the Mach number of 1, you can see something very interesting is happening to this differential equation when r is at that critical radius. Right? It'll turn out that that's the sonic point. That's, when, that's the point above the surface of the sun when the plasma is going to go supersonic. 
The least interesting for me part of Parker's paper is when he attempts to solve that equation. The problem being there are five separate classes of solutions to this differential equation. Some of them are meaningless. Some of them are valid but not for the sun. If you take the Parker equation and you run it backwards in time, you actually get an equation called Bondi accretion flow, which uh, describes how matter falls onto black holes and neutron stars. Cool, but not applicable to the heliosphere. So this is the uh, final solution to the differential equation applicable to the solar wind and the solar corona. It, you can't really manipulate it analytically very well, but it's pretty easy to plug in numbers and solve. And some comments. Uh, so here from Parker's paper, this is speed as a function of distance from the sun uh, approximately in uh, solar radii. Uh, speed profiles for different temperatures. So one million degrees Kelvin, uh, you have rapid acceleration out to around 20 or 30 solar radii, and then an asymptotic speed of around 300 kilometers per second. Two and a half million, 600 kilometers per second. All of the plasma being accelerated to these supersonic speeds. Um, so very effective. It easily produces the high speeds that we observe at 1AU with temperatures that are consistent with uh, what spectroscopy tells us is happening in the solar corona. Now for r much greater than rc, that critical uh, height, uh, the speed is you know, larger than the sound speed. Uh, and we can approximate v uh, through this equation, just twice the speed of sound and the square root of the logarithm of the ratio of the distance. This might come in handy in the problem set. Uh, also, just remark, you, you can calculate uh, how the density falls off. Uh, and this model does give you zero pressure at infinity. So it is compatible with the fact that ultimately you need to run into interstellar space. There are so many paths for improvement to this basic equation. And we are still working our way through understanding and appreciating the differences between the simple model and the real solar wind. And I'll just mention a, a couple. We could remove this assumption of an isothermal corona. In fact, that's one of the first things you really need to do. You know, Chapman's model of a static extended atmosphere might not have been correct, but he was using a much better model for heat conduction, right? You know, actually allowing heat to flow throughout the plasma and having different temperatures. Ideally, what you want to do, and this is, this is one of the holy grails in coronal and solar wind science, is develop a self-consistent solution that somehow heats the corona. We don't know if that's through flares or the dissipation of waves or turbulence. Ben Chandran will be talking about this uh, in the next lecture. Um, but however the corona is heated, to somehow have that heating produce the coronal temperature and produce the solar wind acceleration in one go. This is one of the holy grails in our field. You can also use more realistic uh, equations of state you know, for the evolution of the internal energy of the plasma. Um, you can use a polytrope where the, the pressure goes as a density to some power. Um, there are a lot of other things that I've brushed over. The ion and electron temperatures aren't the same anywhere in the solar wind or the solar corona. Uh, the different species of ions tend to have different temperatures. Uh, I talked about how important it is to have this divergent expansion. Well, you know in the corona, the magnetic field can, can sort of force the plasma to do what it wants. So the magnetic field can adjust that divergence. And so you really want to fold in the effects of the magnetic field topology and how that overexpansion of the field might reduce the efficiency of the acceleration. Have any of you ever heard of uh, like expansion factors in the solar corona? If you study like, yeah, if, if you're looking at like, like, you remember Carl Schreiber yesterday kept talking about uh, force-free uh, potential, PFSS, potential force-free source surface something. Yeah, I'm forgetting what it stands for. But anyway, there are all these mechanisms for calculating the magnetic structure within the corona. And, and then once you have tried to calculate that, you can look at how quickly the field is expanding. A lot of our 3D simulations of the solar wind and the inner and outer heliosphere that we use for you know, predicting the interaction of the solar wind and interstellar space or space weather and predictive modeling of coronal mass ejections, we don't actually start with a model of the surface of the sun, and then you know, the entire corona develops. Uh, often what we do is we take those magnetic field expansion rates, have a formula 
that basically says this overexpansion reduces the efficiency of the Parker model. And that gives you an initial speed as a seed at an inner boundary region that then is fed into your nice 3D MHD model. Um, there's also the fact that there's extended injection of energy into the corona and the solar wind from processes like waves and reconnection. And the last question, the problem set, you're going to do two things. One, I kept talking about momentum and conservation of mass flux. We're going to consider the energy equation and what happens to the internal energy of the solar wind as it expands. You're actually going to calculate how much extra energy and extra heating is happening uh, to the solar wind as it expands. Because it turns out the heating doesn't stop in the corona. It extends all the way out past the orbit of the Earth. All right, so now let's talk about in situ solar wind measurements. Uh, I, I put this up from Star Trek I, the motion picture, uh, because they're standing in front of V'ger, which was really just uh, one of the engineering models of the Voyager 2 spacecraft. Uh, and if you look uh, closely, you can see this big honking device here is a Faraday cup plasma instrument that measured the solar wind. Now I'll talk about non-movie based solar wind measurements. So what are some of the observational challenges to directly measuring the solar wind? Well, one is location. Uh, I think you've all now discussed the bow shock and the magnetosphere and all that. So I will not get into the details. I will just point out that, you know, you work so hard at building a rocket that can like, you know, just get out of the atmosphere. You don't see the solar wind. You see uh, the magnetosphere, which is fascinating to study, but doesn't tell you if there really is a supersonic flow in interplanetary space. You need to have a rocket get out to like 30 solar radii or more to really see the solar wind. Uh, if you need the solar wind at 1 AU for your studies, what you usually do is you don't go to a spacecraft near Earth orbit. You go to an L1 monitor, so a spacecraft parked at the first Lagrangian point uh, which is about 1% of an AU towards the sun. Currently, we have spacecraft like ACE and WIND there. Those are L1 monitors. Uh, here's some other spacecraft you used for earlier periods. But early on, when we were just trying to get objects into space, people were not going, we should go to L1 as a first go. So it took a little while before we got enough altitude to see the solar wind. Now, the second observational challenge is just actually making a measurement of the solar wind. You know, if I told you measure the density and temperature and speed of the air in this room, I think we could figure out how to do that. Maybe buy some stuff at Home Depot. It's pretty straightforward. But a plasma is a very unusual uh, beast. We can't use the, a lot of the equipment that we use on Earth for measuring flow and density and temperature. A solar wind instrument needs to measure the velocity distribution function. So that's the number of particles as a function of speed. What we want to do is make this map so we can fit that Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function to it. Right? The width is just the temperature. The total number of particles is the density. Um, and the mean speed is the velocity. So you know, why can't we just fly like an anemometer and a, and a weather vane, right? A uh, bunch of reasons. One. Uh, the photon pressure is actually as strong as the particle pressure in space. So you'd, you'd also be measuring the photons from the sun and their effect. But also because the solar wind is not in equilibrium. The relative densities of different species change all the time. Like the helium to hydrogen ratio is all over the map in the solar wind. It can be 4.5% usually, but in a coronal mass ejection, the material ejected from the sun can be 20% helium by number density more than half helium, uh, or the helium just vanishes. Uh, species tend to have different velocities. The densities are really low in interplanetary space. If you measure the speed of hydrogen versus helium versus oxygen, they're not actually moving at the same rate away from the sun. They're flowing through each other, which is a little mind boggling. Um, the species tend to have different temperatures. Often, heavier species will be hotter sometimes in a kind of mass proportional way. Um, that, that is one of the indications that the heating going on in the corona is, uh, let's call it unusual. Right? It seems to know your like, mass or your charge to mass ratio. So it involves waves in some way. And temperatures can be hard to define, really. Here's a raw solar wind measurement uh, taken at 0.4 AU by the Helios spacecraft. 
of solar wind at 500 kilometers per second. We're looking in a two-dimensional plane in velocity. The colors and contours tell you the density of protons. So what should I, and this is logarithmic. So this should be straightforward, right? I should see circles and they're falling off and I fit a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function to this and I'm good. I got the velocity, the density, the temperature. But this, these are not circles, these are ovals. And there's a, a bump here. Uh, this red arrow gives you the local direction of the magnetic field. And what you see in the solar wind is that the plasma tends to be anisotropic. It has a, the same particles have one temperature if you look along the magnetic field, but another temperature if you look at their wiggling perpendicular to the magnetic field. On Earth, that would be like somehow having a, a pot of water that was you know, ice in one direction, but steam when you turned it in the other direction. Because these anisotropies can be factors of 10 or 20 different. Okay, so these raw measurements, you need an instrument that maps out the number of ions and electrons as a function of direction energy. So that's a little challenging. Um, I'll just give you an example of one type of solar wind instrument. That's a Faraday cup, near and dear to me. I, I work on Faraday cups and their design. Um, Faraday cups, also known as retarding potential analyzers, are basically just glorified vacuum tubes without the glass. So it's a bunch of grids. You use high voltages. Particles either have enough energy to make it through the grids, or they don't and they get reflected. And you kind of measure the spectrum of particles as a function of energy that way. This is the Voyager plasma instrument. Uh, it's about this big across. It had to be very large because you know Voyager is out at 100 AU and the signals are extremely weak out there. Uh, this is uh, our design for the solar probe cup. So this is a Faraday cup that's going to go on the solar probe spacecraft. It's going to peer around a heat shield uh, around eight and a half solar radii above the surface of the sun. Um, so the sun, well, the good news is the densities will be about 520 times higher than they are at Earth. So the signal will be nice and strong. But the sun will be 12 degrees across and 520 times brighter, dumping about 10 kilowatts of heat just into this uh, instrument. Um, so we've made it as small as possible. This is not to scale. Just thought you might like to see how some of these instruments work. So here's my Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution function. And let's consider particles with three energies in this red range, this green range, and this blue range. And here, deep in my instrument, I have some grid that I put a high voltage on. And it sets up an electric field. And let's say I wiggle back and forth between the lower voltage and the upper voltage in this green region. I'll have three categories of particles. Everything red and lower just always comes in, slows down, and gets reflected out, no matter what the voltage is on that grid as it's oscillating. The blue particles and everything with higher energy, they always make it through. The green particles either make it through or get reflected out. Now, are any of you interested in instrumentation? Electronics? OK. So this might just be uh, interesting for you three or four. But what we do is we now have a AC current signal. right? And the trick to being able to detect that is you build an instrument that only locks in on that AC signal. So we do that. Uh, we have different high voltages. Each high voltage gives us some um, AC current. We lock in on that current. We measure it. And that gives us a map of the flux of particles as a function of energy. And then we look in different directions, and we're able to make this map in 3D. All right, so reaching for the solar wind. Uh, here's some of the first attempts at measuring the solar wind. Luna 2 was a Soviet spacecraft launched in 59. It was the first artificial object to reach uh, Earth escape speed. It could not measure the distribution function. It could just measure the uh, total flux. Uh, and it saw a flux of around 2 10 to the 8 centimeters per centimeter squared per second, which is actually uh, pretty close to what we observe at 1 AU. So this indicated that there was indeed a flux of ions, but we didn't know if it was the breeze or the supersonic flow. Explorer 10, which was launched in 61, um, had a Faraday cup on it, a plasma instrument. It was able to measure density, velocity, and temperature, which was great. But it just turned out, because of the local time that it was launched at, it didn't quite make it out in the solar wind. It zipped up into the magnetosheath. And the 
people running the instrument saw you know, really hot, really dense flow at like a big angle relative to the Sun-Earth line. And they said, huh, maybe there really is a supersonic solar wind and it was just deflected by the bow shock, so there probably really is a solar wind. A good argument, but it was, still wasn't the, the direct detection. Okay, August 1962, the Mariner 2 spacecraft, and look at the progression just in the course of a couple of years. And I'm just highlighting a few missions that were launched during this period. Stuff's going up every few months. This was the first planetary encounter. It went to Venus. It took 113 days of data. It's described by many as a, a very miraculous mission for a lot of reasons. First planetary encounter, first mission in interplanetary space. During launch, the guidance system on the rocket failed and actually did a loop-the-loop -loop in the sky before the system turned back on. And it still managed to escape and make it into its interplanetary orbit. We, we, things were a little faster and looser back then. Um, it had 113 days of data. Uh, here's an example of a uh, energy per charge spectrum of solar wind ions. So current as a function of energy per charge, that's the voltage we put on the grids. Here are protons and here are alpha particles. Uh, I won't get into this, but if you think about it, uh, so proton, hydrogen and helium both fully ionized in the solar wind, all right? They have different charge to mass ratios. So if they're moving at about the same speed, but my instrument uses a voltage to stop them, I'll actually see them at different voltages if they're moving at the same speed. And it's pretty straightforward to calculate what that difference in voltages would be for different charge to mass ratios. Now, this is not necessarily great enough to calculate precise temperatures and uh, densities and velocities, but it was enough to make some really amazing measurements. One, uh, there was a confirmation that there was a continuous radial flow of plasma. There were high and low speed streams ranging from about 300 to 800 kilometers per second. The densities were about right. Fascinating stuff was going on if you compare the helium and the hydrogen. Similar velocities, but the helium was often surfing along at about the alphane speed, faster than the protons. Um, the abundance ratio of helium was variable. Um, and uh, the helium was about four times hotter than the protons. Okay, so that was some of the early exploration. Today, you know, we have a huge heliospheric observatory that we can go to for measurements at different points in interplanetary space. Um, you know, I think you've seen a couple of these charts over the last week, so I'm not going to spell out every single uh, mission in the fleet. Uh, but you know, we have the Voyagers at the outer edges of the heliosphere. Uh, we have the stereo spacecraft moving around the sun at 1 AU. Uh, and we have a whole fleet of spacecraft at L1 in an Earth orbit. And we have future missions planned, including the European Solar Orbiter mission and the NASA Solar Probe Plus mission. And I'm involved in Solar Pro Plus, and one of the things we wanted to do this week is kind of give you a sense of upcoming opportunities uh, over the next few years. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit now about Solar Probe Plus. So this is an artist concept of the spacecraft. Um, Parker had published his predictions in 58. Pretty soon after that, uh, people started talking about sending a spacecraft into the corona to figure out if these predictions were correct. This predates NASA. Right? So people have been talking about a solar probe for more than 40 or 50 years. We've always wanted to do it, but we needed the technology to mature to the point that it was actually feasible. So some of the early ideas for a solar probe, you had a heat shield that would somehow burn up during the encounter, but burn up fast enough that the heat wasn't conducted into the spacecraft and the instruments. And it would survive one encounter of a few minutes. Um, maybe that would work, but it's very hard to make detailed measurements of the plasma around you when you're on fire. So that didn't pan out. Every decade, a new design for the mission has been proposed. In around 2007, a concept was shown for a mission called Solar Probe Plus. It's plus because it does more stuff. Um, and, uh, and this was actually uh, approved. Uh, there's an instrument payload. There we're in a sort of preliminary design phase now. And our launch is planned for 2018. And I'll just tell you a little bit about it. So this is an artist concept of the spacecraft from our review uh, last year. Uh, what you can see first and foremost is a massive heat shield made of uh, this amazing stuff called carbon foam. 
the sun-facing side of this absorbs about um, half a megawatt at closest approach, which, as I said, is about eight and a half solar radii above the surface. Um, these are water-filled radiators that dump heat out into interplanetary space. Um, here are solar panels that actually retract backwards as we get closer to the sun. So at closest approach, just the tips of the panels stick out and see just a little bit of the sunlight that's making its way across the sharp edge of the heat shield. And the whole spacecraft is bristling with instrumentation. You know, we've looked, you've looked at uh, the magnetohydrodynamic equations in the last week, right? What keeps coming up? B, V, N, T, right? If you want to understand what's going on in the corona, we need to be able to measure these properties. We need the electric fields, the magnetic fields, the density, the temperature. Uh, I'll just point out, here you can see uh, the electric field booms that can measure the local electric field. Here's a long boom that has magnetometers on it to measure the magnetic field. Uh, here is the Valiant solar probe cup sticking around the heat shield and staring uh, straight at the sun so we can see the wind flowing away. Now, the early solar probe concepts called for things like going out, ironically, to Jupiter, using a gravitational encounter with Jupiter to slow down the spacecraft almost completely, and then it would just plunge down into the uh, close surface of the sun. You'd have one encounter, and then maybe five or six years later, a second encounter. Uh, one of the pluses in Solar Probe Plus was we instead use a very big rocket, and we go to Venus. Uh, so we have a encounter with Venus just a couple months after launch in 2018, and just one month uh, no, that was that. Just three months after that, no, sorry, here we are. Just one month after that, we have our first perihelion or closest approach at 35 solar radii. Over the course of the next six years, we have six more Venus encounters. And each time we encounter Venus, we slow down a little bit more. And we plunge closer into the sun's atmosphere, culminating in the eight and a half solar radii orbit. So we'll be able to watch how the corona evolves over half a solar cycle, and we'll also be able to slowly get slower and slower in. Now, here's just a little schematic um, kind of summarizing the orbit and uh, what I've told you about uh, the solar wind. Here is a model of an expected solar wind speed profile in kilometers per second as a function of distance from the sun. Here is a model of the alphane speed. Right? Now, this is a little speculative, right? If we had if we knew what was going on there, if we had a way of measuring this, we wouldn't need a spacecraft. Uh, but somewhere around 15 solar radii, we think the plasma becomes super alphanic. Now, you'll calculate in the problem set what kind of radii Parker predicts the plasma goes supersonic. But remember, in a magnetohydrodynamic plasma, information is communicated through the magnetic field in addition to sound waves. So it's this altitude here when we exceed the alphane speed where the wind truly becomes separate from the solar atmosphere. Uh, you know, and information can no longer flow back to the sun. So we need to get underneath this surface, which we will in our last uh, dozen orbits or so, in order to probe the, the magnetic environment of the sun. OK, so I think I have half an hour. Uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, give you some more just um, facts about the sun and the solar wind and some of the structures that we observe. Uh, I have some number of slides on, on different things that I think it would just be good for you to know. Uh, I'll end with that. Uh, and then I actually, as sort of an appendix, I have a, a lot of other examples of interesting things that go on the solar wind that I thought might be useful for your reference. So this will all be uh, posted online. So let's uh, talk now about the steady state solar wind. And of course, I say steady state because we know from all these solar images that steady is a little hard to define. So here is my obligatory large table of numbers, um, just giving you typical conditions of the solar wind at 1 AU in terms of density, speeds, magnetic fields, temperatures. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these uh, numbers. It's just you know, often good to know and good to have for reference. Uh, for instance, you know, how much hotter the electrons can be than protons. Uh, what the typical temperatures are for protons and electrons, and that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to go through this in detail, but here you have it. Let's look at a couple trends at 1 AU. So I said there's spacecraft at the um, L1 halo orbit. Uh, one of them is the wind spacecraft. 
It was launched in October 94, and it's measured the solar wind something like five and a half million times uh, since launch. So here's looking at the distribution of about four and a half million of those measurements through, I think, 2005. So first in the upper panel, I have a histogram. Note this is the logarithm of the number of measurements as a function of speed. Right? So just so you have a sense that at 1 AU, the typical speeds that you see are between three and 400 kilometers per second. You can see fast wind you know, going all the way up to 700, 800 kilometers per second. But you don't see it that often in the ecliptic plane in Earth's orbit. If you want to see a lot of really fast solar wind, um, you know, you use a spacecraft like Ulysses and you go over the poles of the sun during solar minimum, you see a lot of fast wind flow, which I'll show you in a little bit. Now, here is the distribution of proton number density versus speed. And what I've done is I've normalized uh, each column to unity. So you can just see the, the trend in the typical density as a function of speed. Um, and I fit a line through the mean value. And you can see that in the solar wind, as the speed goes up, the density goes down. Um, and in fact, it's a pretty decent inverse relationship. On average, the mass flux of the solar wind is pretty constant. Um, that's, that's interesting. Uh, that's something people are still trying to figure out. What, what's going on in the corona that wants to preserve the, the mass flux to first order? Now here's the thermal speed. Remember, thermal speed squared is proportional to the temperature of the plasma as a function of the bulk speed. And again, here you have a, a beautiful linear relationship. The thermal speed is approximately the sound speed in the plasma. So if I take the ratio of the bulk speed to the thermal speed, I can also figure out approximately the Mach number, the sonic Mach number of the plasma flow. And the slope of this line is about uh, one-tenth. So the, the typical Mach number of the solar wind, again, surprisingly independent of speed, is about Mach 10 in terms of the sound speed. But as you can see, there's, there's huge variability. OK, sources of the solar wind, we could spend the entire day talking about different attempts to map different solar wind structures seen uh, in space to different source regions. Uh, I'm not going to go through that in great detail. I think you've already seen some presentations talking about polar coronal holes with you know, open magnetic field lines seem to give off like very fast and steady wind. Um, closed field regions seem to be associated with the heliospheric current sheet and streamer belts and seem to kind of give off a more intermittent slow solar wind. <clears throat> and, and that is the standard paradigm, so I'll, I'll parrot that. I mean, there's obviously uh, more going on, uh, but our basic picture is you have this fast wind emerging all the time from regions with open field lines. Slow solar wind either coming from these loops or maybe from the boundaries of these closed field regions. There are other sources, there are active regions uh, that may be able to produce unusual solar wind. And of course, there are transients, like coronal mass ejections, that produce very unusual solar wind. Right? <clears throat> and you might ask yourself, you know, I can look in the data and I can see a huge coronal mass ejection. It's pretty easy. I have some examples uh, in these slides. Uh, there's a whole spectrum of sizes of coronal mass ejections. And at some point, they become so small that they don't really survive out to 1 AU. So there was an eruption close to the sun, but you don't really see anything special in the solar wind data. And you know, one thing worth asking is uh, if, we, if we examine this, par this uh, paradigm a little too closely, it starts to fall apart. Like, you know, what if the slow solar wind is just made up of millions of tiny little CMEs constantly popping off? You know, we couldn't see that really in the solar wind at least not at 1 AU, where everything's just kind of merged together. Here's several months of data at 1 AU. Uh, again, you can see this is the wind speed as a function of time. It's uh, 120 days, 100, yeah, 120 days. Speed goes up, speed goes down. There's a lot of structure here. Um, and it's a little periodic. You get reoccurring, you get reoccurring structures in the speed. What period does anyone think we should expect for that reoccurrence? 27 days. That's right. So if we have some structure on the sun that's producing a particular type of solar wind, it's going to come around, and we'll see it again. 
So let's fold these data. Let's divide uh, modulo the day by 27 and stack all the data. And indeed, what you see is you know, that high speed stream lines up very nicely with each uh, rotation. So if we were looking at the sun during this period, we'd see a nice coronal hole that was stretching down to near the equatorial plane. And every month, it kind of comes back and rotates over again. It's obviously evolving with time. Right? But, but you can see that there is this uh, clear association between um, different structures on the sun and the types of solar wind you see at 1 AU. So you can get slow wind, slow wind, and then suddenly you're seeing fast wind. Now let's talk a little bit about the evolution of a stream into space. So steady state, here's some surface above the sun, all right, and it's rotating at whatever angular speed you want to pick. Remember, it's, the sun has a complex differential rotation, so 27 days in the equator from our point of view, but more like 34 days at the poles. <clears throat> so let's look at parcels of plasma coming off the surface at eight separate intervals in time uniformly spaced. What's going to happen? Well, here's the trajectory that they'll have taken, right? When this piece of plasma is emitted, this one's gotten here, but that one has made it that far out, right? And so the streamline of plasma coming from one point on the sun, this is a little unintuitive, actually follows on a spiral pattern, an Archimedean spiral. It's not a, you know, it's not just radiating outwards. When you look at coronagraphs, like the movie I showed you at the very beginning of this talk, you know, everything looked like it was going in a nice line, right? And that's the case very close to the sun. But as you get further out, you start to get this wrapping. And I'm not going to derive this here, but uh, we, we tend to call this the Parker spiral. And it's actually uh, pretty straightforward to come up with the uh, equation for this line for the Parker spiral. It's basically just a function of the speed of the plasma. If you assume it's constant, not accelerating, uh, how far you are from the surface it emerged from, and how fast the sun's rotating. Now, Parker also showed that if you assume the magnetic field is divergenceless, um, and B is initially pointing out radially where this plasma emerged, uh, then it's simple to calculate an equation for the magnetic field further out from the sun. The magnetic field also winds on this Parker spiral. And this is really cool. Um, first of all, you, you really do see this. If you go and look at a couple months of the solar wind, the magnetic field is, you know, unless something unusual is going on, it's not radial, it's not orthogonal, it's, it's flowing at an angle of about 45, 35 to 45 degrees at 1 AU. The further out from the sun you get, the tighter that spiral becomes, though. And by the time you're out at 5, so 5 AU or so and 10 AU, the magnetic field is just going around like this. Um, and this is one reason that um, galactic cosmic rays have trouble getting into uh, Earth at 1 AU. You know, they're not just easily streaming along a magnetic field line. They've got this big, complex, wound up structure they need to navigate. So let's talk about interactions of streams. I hope someone here gets this. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so now imagine, again, steady state. But I've got two adjacent regions on the sun. First, the leading region is giving off a slow solar wind. And it's just kind of ambling out. And it's going to make a streamline uh, with the slow solar wind uh, solution. But what if right after that, I have fast solar wind. And I showed you in that, that plot of 100 days of data, that happens all the time. right? You will see slow wind and then fast wind after it. Well, what happens is sooner or later, some distance from the sun, that fast solar wind is going to run into the slow solar wind ahead of it. Uh, and it's going to start to create a compression as they begin to interact. This is a one-dimensional hydrodynamic simulation from the textbook. Um, here we're showing flow speed. And a steady state solution with slow wind uh, was used at t equals 0. And then this bump of high speed wind was injected. And it proceeded to travel away from the sun and overtake and then begin to interact with the slow solar wind ahead of it. This is the pressure. 
and you can see, you begin to see a bump in pressure as these two streams are running into each other, they're compressing the plasma. You can only compress it so far before the gradient in pressure becomes so strong that shocks form. Uh, and typically out at you know, one AU and, and beyond, these stream interactions, instead of just seeing like, oh, the speed change from fast to slow, or from slow to fast, you'll actually also see compressions, and then actually pairs of shocks. And out at five AU or so, those shocks can become strong enough that they can actually accelerate uh, energetic particles on their own. Let's talk a little bit about the three-dimensional structure of the solar wind. First, in terms of radius. So Helios uh, is the closest uh, spacecraft. It's actually a pair of spacecraft that we've ever gotten to the sun, um, approximately a third of an AU. Here are data taken at different distances from the sun with Helios. So here we're at 0.3 AU. Uh, this is slow wind, and then this is fast wind. And this kind of sums up the um, standard paradigm for the solar wind. If you look at faster solar wind, it has more of these unusual signatures, temperature anisotropies. I didn't get into this, but you actually often see two separate Maxwellian distributions of protons. We call one the beam because it typically has a smaller density. But it's the same species of particle with a totally different velocity, density, and temperature flowing through it. We don't really understand what's going on in the corona that produced these beams. You tend to see this stuff more in the fast solar wind, although the closer you get to the sun, the more non-thermal or non-Maxwellian all of the plasma begins to behave. Um, and there's a word of caution. You sh I don't think it's a good idea to think of the slow wind as just a fluid, and it's the fast wind that has all this weird kinetic stuff. It's very possible that the slow wind, since it takes longer to get to us, um, and since it has higher densities, it has higher collision frequencies. It tends to damp out all this interesting stuff. So one big question for us when we get close to the sun is, is this non-thermal stuff due to wave particle interactions and all sorts of interesting uh, plasma physics, is that just the domain of the fast wind or is that perhaps also happening in the slow wind? Let's now, instead of looking at spectra, look at actual measurements of temperature as a function of distance from the sun. Um, this is a, a model, a multi-fluid model with turbulence of how the temperature might vary. So here we're at the surface of the photosphere, transition region, boom, temperature jumps up. You have this hot corona at a couple million degrees, and the temperature falls off at some rate. Um, here I show the regions that we have measurements of with uh, spacecraft that have already flown. Here we have remote measurements of temperatures. You can see here the proton temperature, what we think the oxygen temperature is. So as I said, different species can get heated uh, to much higher temperatures. And species like oxygen are 20, 30, maybe 40 times hotter than the protons. Um, so we do have a big observational gap here in this box is the region that probe is going to explore. Now, one thing Ben is going to talk about is um, you know, what, what's the source of this heating? How do I, what could I have that could produce hot plasma? Um, we have a lot of fluctuations and waves in the corona in the solar wind. Um, and those waves can get dissipated, like ocean waves breaking on the shore. Instead of scattering sand, they're heating plasma. It's a bad analogy, maybe. Uh, but we have a lot of measurements of the amplitude of velocity fluctuations at different locations. Um, as well. Here are remote observations of the amplitude of fluctuations close to the sun. Here are fluctuations far from the sun. And we don't really know how to make this black curve that, that line matches up these uh, different measurements of fluctuations. But presumably, you know, we have a lot of waves here. <clears throat> Those waves may be dissipated and play a strong role in heating the plasma and producing the temperatures we see at 1 AU. Now, what are the effects of a more realistic magnetic topology on the sun? So during solar minimum, the streamer belt, you know, we have nice polar coronal holes. The streamer belt is pretty much in the ecliptic plane. But as solar activity increases, you know, the coronal holes are moving around. The streamer belt tends to be sort of tilted at some angle. <clears throat> and so instead of a, remember, the magnetic field reverses polarity right here along the surface. That's the heliospheric current sheet.
So what does that current sheet look like if the whole streamer belt is tilted and the system's rotating? And here's just a sketch in three dimensions of what that heliospheric current sheet would look like, the boundary between you know, magnetic field coming into the sun on one pole, coming out on another pole, and it becomes actually very complicated. Here's some data from 2005 kind of illustrating this. So I'm not going to go through every single thing, but what we're seeing are these stream interfaces. Um, so here's proton number density, proton temperature, uh, pressure, and velocity. And let's focus on this one first. You have high speed, and then it goes down to slow speed, high speed, slow speed, high speed, slow speed, right? So we're sampling different regions of high speed solar wind flow. This is the radial component of the magnetic field. And you can see it's BR is positive, then it's negative, negative, positive, negative. And up here, we're just giving the sign of the polarity of the magnetic field. And so I'm not going to go into too much of the details of this three-dimensional interaction. But you can see what's happening here. We're passing from high-speed wind coming from a coronal hole on one pole of the sun into the streamer belt crossing the heliospheric current sheet, and that's what these uh, lines indicate, so crossing through the surface. And then we're seeing fast solar wind coming from a coronal hole on the other pole of the sun. Three dimensions. Um, the Ulysses spacecraft went out to Jupiter and did a gravitational assist uh, in 1990. Instead of using that assist to plunge into the sun's atmosphere, um, it used it to change its angular momentum vector and pass out of the ecliptic plane. So Ulysses was in a five-year period orbit that took it almost over the poles of the sun. And I mean, this was a fantastic opportunity to measure the three-dimensional structure of the sun. And there were many surprises. So this is a plot of uh, the black line is the mean sunspot number as a function of time. The red is the sort of mean tilt of the current sheet out of the ecliptic plane. So the more solar activity we have, the more that current sheet is tilted at some weird angle. And here is the uh, data collected during each of these crossings over the poles of the sun by Ulysses. So there were three orbits about five years apart. This one and this one took place during solar minimum. This one took place during solar maximum. Um, these images in the back are coronagraph images taken, representative images taken during those encounters. Don't get too excited about trying to match this up to that, because this image was taken in a minute. You know, This passage took many months. But if we look at the data, this is a polar plot where the radial component shows the speed measured at different latitudes. And the color shading gives you the magnetic polarity. And so you can see very clearly what's going on during solar minimum. You have these polar coronal holes. Right? And they're producing very high speed solar wind right, with pretty much uniform polarity. So you have inward magnetic field coming into this polar cap, this entire section of the passage, outward polarity, this entire section. And then you have the very chaotic streamer belt in a range of uh, latitudes near the equatorial plane where you have inward and outward polarity and very variable solar wind speeds. Um, but overall, a pretty nice representation of the three-dimensional inner heliosphere. During solar, and you see the same thing during the next solar minimum passage, only if you look, you'll see that the polarities have actually reversed, right? And that's just because the sun's magnetic moment has flipped. When you have heightened solar activity, on the other hand, you see uh, total chaos. So this nice you know, polar coronal holes, streamer belt, uh, structure and this easily predictable current sheet really only holds during solar minimum conditions. Um, there are a lot of questions we're still trying to answer about this three-dimensional structure. You know, you'll note that the streamer belt close to the sun seems to be really narrow. Right? The, it, it doesn't seem to f extend out into a broad range of uh, latitude. And yet Ulysses saw slow solar wind over a very broad range of latitude. So one thing we're trying to figure out is, how do you start with a narrow streamer close to the sun, but then have that 
by the time you get out to 1 AU or more, expand to fill a, a very broad range of latitudes only with slow solar wind. And this is a photograph of an eclipse that's been sharpened uh, to make the detail uh, more apparent. Uh, this is a high resolution magnetohydrodynamic simulation of the corona uh, where the red uh, coloring basically indicates shear in the magnetic field. Um, so people are also trying to figure out how, you know, I looked at, you know, I showed you this at the beginning. I said, oh, well, that's obviously the magnetic structure. Well, you know, why? Why, why is the density correlated with the magnetic field? Is it just, uh, you know, stronger magnetic field has more plasma or is it something more complicated? And that is also an open topic of study. Now, a word about the outer limits. Uh, so, <clears throat> When was this predicted? So pretty soon after the solar wind was accepted, no, I'm sorry, before the solar wind was really accepted, there were ideas that there had to be a boundary beyond Earth orbit to explain the spectrum of galactic cosmic rays. You know, cosmic rays fall along a power law. The higher energy you go, the fewer of them there are. And you go down to lower and lower energies, there are more cosmic rays. But then that power law breaks, and you don't see cosmic rays reaching us. And so the thought was there must be some surface or region beyond Earth orbit that's blocking the entrance of cosmic rays. Once the solar wind was adopted, people realized, well, wait a minute, if there's a supersonic flow, at some point it's got to stop and merge with interstellar space. We'll call that the termination shock. It'll go from supersonic to subsonic. All sorts of stuff will happen there. Maybe that's what blocks cosmic rays from getting in. And this termination shock, it's probably at like 1.1 AU. And then we got out to 1.1 AU and it wasn't there. And the models were refined. No, you know, it's more like out at Mars orbit. Then it wasn't seen. OK, 2 AU, 5 AU. There's a great plot showing the distance of the Voyager spacecraft from the sun as a function of time. And then the updated theoretical predictions of the termination shock. Um, until we finally observed the termination shock actually all the way out at around 100 AU. And I just thought, uh, I think that some of the last data I'll show you is this measurement of the very outer limits of the solar wind. So here we were in 2007. Um, I'm sorry, that should say 2007. Here we are in 2007. Uh, the Voyager spacecraft launched in 1977. Right? They've been operating nonstop for 30 years. There's a cosmic ray telescope on board that is a stepper motor that clicks every 10 seconds. And that's been operating in space for three decades. Um, it takes light something like 18 hours to get back and forth. It's pretty amazing. Anyway, by the time you're that far away from the sun, and I didn't get into this, but if you read the chapter on the solar wind, there's some discussion of this. You know, all these exciting streams have interacted. The shocks have formed. Things have kind of smoothed out. There's just a pretty steady flow of solar wind. So here we are, you know, 150 days. We're just measuring the same speed. We've been measuring about the same speed for half a year. And then suddenly the speed dropped down. Right? And the temperature jumped up and the density kind of went up. Uh, and so that was our crossing of the termination shock. And zooming in, if you look more closely, here's I'm taking the speed and the density. I'm just calculating the energy per particle. And there was actually an indicator for about uh, 100 days beforehand that the energy of the uh, solar wind was starting to drop down, like it was approaching some surface. Fascinating surprise for many of us was this is the Mach number of the flow. Remember at 1 AU, the Mach number is around uh, 10. Here we are. Uh, I'm looking at the solar wind data. The Mach number is around 9, steadily dropping down to around 8. And then it crosses this termination shock, and the Mach number of the flow is 2. W what is that? Right? That's not, that doesn't make sense from a standard fluid picture of a, of a shock. Uh, it should be subsonic. Uh, what's happening here is to calculate this Mach number, we just used the speed of sound based on the thermal width of the particles. Remember earlier I said, oh, well, as we all know, if I know the thermal speed of the particles, that's approximately the sound speed. When you're out at 1 AU, the pressure from cosmic rays and radiation is actually so large uh, 
that it influences the dynamics of the plasma. It modifies the speed of sound. Uh, so the flow is actually subsonic, but only when you include that additional pressure. OK. So as I said, there's a lot more material beyond this about fascinating aspects of the solar wind. I'm not going to get into those here, but you have them for your reference. Um, I'll just close with a couple of remarks. Um, one, you know, there is a lot of very exciting science in the solar wind, science that remains to be done, big open questions that are important for heliophysics and, and for broader studies of plasma physics and energetic astrophysical plasmas. What's special about heliophysics is, as opposed to laboratory plasma um, astrophysical experiments, we can put a spacecraft into the plasma and measure those velocity distribution functions and those electromagnetic fields without distorting the experiment, without you know, contaminating the laboratory experiment. Uh, if we could send a spacecraft to a black hole, I'm sure we, should, we would, but no time soon. And we're able to study very fundamental plasma physics, reconnection, turbulence, instabilities, acceleration. We want to understand the connection between the corona and interplanetary space and how it evolves with time. Uh, we want to understand what signatures of coronal heating and structures are seen embedded in the solar wind. And in, beyond just trying to understand the corona uh, and the solar wind in and of itself, of course, we want to understand how the solar wind interacts with planets, other objects in the solar system, and contributes to space weather. Uh, there are many more questions, uh, and there are very exciting opportunities coming up uh, in solar wind. Um, in particular, exciting new observations. You know, this was obviously a very space-based presentation. There are a lot of very exciting new ground-based observatories coming online as well. Um, but over the next uh, uh, five years, we'll be working on missions like Solar Probe Plus and Solar Orbiter. They'll close the observational gaps between the corona and interplanetary space, uh, directly testing these models of coronal heating and solar wind acceleration that we discussed today. Uh, by entering the magnetic atmosphere of the sun. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. I think there's time for a couple questions, if there are questions. Uh, otherwise, I'll, I'll be hanging out. Come up and talk to me if you're interested in any of this. Uh, I'll stop by the recitation room tonight. Any questions? Excellent, excellent question. So the, the point is, you know, some things act very quickly in the solar, the question is some things act very quickly in the solar wind, like instabilities. Um, and like dissipation, which Ben will talk about, happens at like the proton gyro frequency. So what do we do on a mission like Solar Probe Plus, where all the time scales are boosted up by like a factor of 100? And, and the answer is the instruments just have to be designed to make those measurements 100 times faster. So the wind spacecraft I showed you, we measure the proton flow angles um, once every 92 seconds. On Solar Probe Plus, that Solar Probe Cup I showed you, can measure the proton flow angles at 128 hertz. Uh, likewise, the vector magnetic field is always returned at 128 hertz, vector electric field. Um, and those are just the, the normal data products. There'll be burst electromagnetic measurements going up to you know, many tens or hundreds of kilohertz. And, and we need that resolution if we're going to be able to see dissipation, um, you know, small scale current sheets, magnetic reconnection and the like. Fortunately, um, while those are very fast measurement rates, the signals are all a lot stronger. So that, that helps us a little bit. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For for something like solar probe? Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh, yes, I will. Well, so, so one nice thing about Solar Probe in particular is it, it has, um, I think, what might be the first um, vector DC electric field measurements on a spacecraft in interplanetary space. So we'll have simultaneous measurements of V, B, N, um, and E vector going up to um, 128 hertz. Uh, and then we have vector E and B measurements going up all the way to megahertz. So one of the things we do is we look just at uh, correlations between like phase relationships between electromagnetic field fluctuations. Um, we're hoping to have an onboard particle correlator so we can actually communicate in a high speed link how many particles we're seeing at a very high rate and correlate that with magnetic or electric fluctuations. Um, so a lot of that's done in situ. Um, as you know, you know, one of the problems with looking at, one of the challenges with looking at waves is it's hard to tell with one spacecraft which way the wave is moving. And you know, often that, that makes it hard to tell if it's really Model A or Model B. Um, so one of the other things we'll do, and this is not unusual, um, it's not novel, um, you do this on other spacecraft. We have those velocity distribution functions also. So you know, do we have a particular type of wave also when we have like a very large temperature anisotropy. You know, we'll, we'll have to combine those data sets very carefully in order to really try to separate the different heating mechanisms. We have identified for all the typical zoo of heating mechanisms what we think the unique signatures are we can detect. But I think no one has ever sent a spacecraft to a new location in the heliosphere and not been dumbfounded by what, by what they found. So you know, we're trying to, as with every mission, be very flexible in the measurements, assuming that we're not going to see anything like what we were expecting. Yep. Yes, that's right. So the, the question was, or the comment was, there, there are a lot of different types of waves that can be doing the heating. That's absolutely true. And you know, I didn't really get into this, but um, so many things are different in the corona than at 1 AU. The beta of the plasma, for instance, the ratio of the particle pressure and magnetic pressure is very different. That means the dispersion relations are all very different. The, the dominant waves, the dominant dissipation modes, therefore, might also be very different from what we see at 1 AU. Well, first, first I'll, I'll be completely straightforward and say that was like an hour's worth of dinner conversation last night uh, with us trying to decide what we thought. Um, so I mean, that, that is an open question. Um, you clearly see signatures that, um, well, so one of the problem set questions, for instance, um, you will demonstrate that there is actually a, a, a rather extreme amount of heating happening to the solar wind, even out at 1 AU. Um, the, the challenge is when we look at something like, you know, the helium is four, or the, under certain circumstances at 1 AU, the helium can be eight or nine times the hydrogen temperature. And is that a relic of something crazy that happened back in the corona, or is it something that's happening in situ? And, and, and that is a, a very open topic of research. You know, you identify these very clear signals, but then you have to say, okay, this is a very clear signal of what? <laughs> yeah. and, and one way I think we can try to break that degeneracy is by, um, I mentioned there's um, collisional relaxation in the plasma. So it's called Coulomb collisions. I, I don't know if that was discussed earlier. Um, but basically, uh, if you have a dense, cool, slow plasma, you have more collisions, and that can kind of relax out these non-thermal effects. So you can kind of use that as an indicator of you know how far back to the sun this non-thermal process must have happened. Uh, the other way to really untangle it is, is to just go there. And, and watch how this stuff varies with distance, and then we can tell. Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, the computer simulation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Okay. So the so the question is: Is there any direct measurement of the magnetic field in the solar corona? Um, and and I will answer that if people are. I'm okay with going up a couple more minutes if this is interesting. Okay. So so f roughly speaking, no. There there are no measurements of magnetic field in the outer corona. We would love to be able to do that. Like for instance. You know, we could use that to try and determine where that alphane point is. So we knew exactly how far down we had to get uh, with emissionless like solar probe, right? Um, and, and also, furthermore, we just need constraints for these giant MHD simulations. You know, there, there are no constraints at 10 solar radii to half an AU, and, and all sorts of weird stuff happens in the models there because we don't have any data to, to constrain what should be happening. Um, one of the only measurements of the magnetic field at like order you know, 5, 10 solar radii, used a process called Faraday rotation. So when you have a linearly polarized uh, wave traveling through a magnetized plasma, it'll, the plane of polarization will actually rotate. And that angle of rotation is a function of the wavelength of the, the wave, but also the integral of the magnetic field and density along the line of sight. So you can watch a linearly polarized signal rotate and if you have some model of what you think the density is, you can say something about the magnetic field. Um, the Helios spacecraft had a big dipole antenna to send the telemetry back. So a group in Germany used the deep space network 24 hours a day, um, but put a big modification on it, a big rotating drum that let them measure the angle that this telemetry from Helios was coming at. And they watched it when Helios you know, looked like it passed behind the sun. Or sorry, it passed behind the sun. It looked like it went through the corona, and obviously it, it was a third of an AU away. But they were able to measure the change in that rotation angle and, and try to back out uh, the magnetic field. That worked really well. There were a couple of papers where you could kind of estimate the magnetic fluctuations. They saw a CME pass by, and they saw like a huge change in the Faraday rotation, maybe due to the magnetic field and the flux rope. But the problem is Helios only did this like, you know, three times. Um, so there are a couple radio arrays under construction. There's one being built in Western Australia called the Murchison Widefield Array. And it's a um, 2,000 antenna low frequency array that takes about a tenth of a terabyte of data a second at low frequencies. And one thing we want to do with that is try to use galaxies that are polarized and watch them pass close to the sun and try to make period rotation maps. Um, MWA is being commissioned starting this fall. So you know, there will be opportunities to propose to get involved with MWA and other arrays like that you know, probably within the next year or so. So I, I think if you're interested in coronal magnetic fields, that might be a very uh, exciting new opportunity. Ah, yes. The question was, is anyone still trying to do coronal seismology to get the magnetic field? Yeah, absolutely. And um, that, that is a little bit outside of my uh, field of specialty. But I know, I know there are a couple different plans for uh, measuring coronal magnetic field, um, including some that could get up to maybe, I think, like one solar radii in height. Um, I don't think they can get you know, five or 10 solar radii above. But everyone's constantly pushing getting above the photosphere. We, we really need more constraints of the magnetic field down at those heights. OK, well, I think uh, we've gone over a little bit. So why don't we end there? And uh, if you have any other questions, feel free to come up and talk to me. Thank you very much.